Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about Barbara Guest's uh, very particular book, uh, Contest from Minneapolis. This is a quote from it. Um, I'm a scholar for making my weird. And my title is Guest Afloat in Determinate Archives of the New York School. And I wanted to start really where we'll um, also gesture towards a sense of atmosphere. So, Barbara Guest, iconic photograph. Um, there she is in the midst of it all, the atmosphere of the Sweden tavern. Um, captures an image of Barbara Guest alongside Frank Parra and gives a partial glimpse of the New York school um, poets and artists. The five years earlier in Paris, they were working as art curator assistant and art critic, um, respectively, on the show New York American, New American Painting, which toured eight European cities. And Kahara um, wrote this poem for guests. <laughs> oh Barbara, do you think we'll ever have anything named after us like Rue Henri, Henri Barbus or Canard à l'Oregon who infected a pale white moonish bateau frigidaire with our melancholy lights and vaguely proud dissemblance? Care for the lack of Malame in the place where heroes fell down is right in our Pushkinesque enclosure as greatness sleeps outside, smiles and bears the purple air of the city. Um, what we have here in, uh, in Ahara's poem for guest is very much a statement of what we come to recognise as the trace of the New York School, this urban poetics of a very particular place. Um, it's a, uh, the desire for fame, albeit a tongue in cheek one, in which they would either have rather have a street named after them or perhaps become notorious as uh, a, a bad meal, a hurricane duck instead of duck orange, which is a hurricane um, on a hurricane. Um, and also you can see here the, um, the address from Paris is very clear, the Francophone mm -hmm. tendencies, um, and obviously that linked to French surrealism. But what I want to concentrate and draw out are those traits, but also the one that's here, um, which is the Pushkin-esque enclosure, the space of make-believe and play, perhaps confinement, which is borne out both the love of Russian novels, fascination with the Russian Revolution, and an orientation to the romance and gossip of society. And I want to think about how these show up um, in, in this very particular work that I'm going to talk about. It also hints, I think, that the poem in its generosity think, hints at the artistic collaboration between painters and poets that still characterise New York School. Um, and following on Guest writing in 1976, um, published ten years after Ahara's death, I want to track some of the directions that Guest takes forward after that first moment of the New York School to suggest some ways that anticipates later work through both breaks and continuities. I want to show how she complicates and extends and extends the rather simplified definition of the relationship between writing and painting that has characterized what's been termed ekphrastic definitions as a singular response to a work of art to the idea of reflection. And I think complicated by Fred Morimarco's work on process, which is really interesting, and re more recent essays. But I think there's more going on, and I want to pick up on what Will has been mentioning in relation to the possibilities of space and context. Guest's book opens up possibilities and associations of the museum gallery as an archive or museum with its own histories, networks of relations between the history of the city, landscape, and specific quite real and then quite imagined for so long. The image on the cover is a painting now in the Minneapolis Gallery. You can see this is the cover of the book. Um, yeah. But this is the painting that it's from um, in the gallery. And um, the note on the wall, this is Rainy Evening on Hennepin Avenue from 1902 by Robert Kohler. Um, and the, the, the writing um, that you have in relation to what's on the wall next to it suggest, makes this question, a rainy night in Paris or something closer to home? The description highlights the links between the artist and French Impressionism. This is an American street scene overlaid with Parisian style. It's a picture of the artist's wife, Marie, and their son, Edwin, along with the family dog. 
a moment which obviously sparked guests' imagination in relation to the running together of what I'm going to turn a Pushkin-esque enclosure of the memories of Paris, European Romanticism transplanted. The building in the background is the Minneapolis Public Library since demolished, since demolished which stood at 10th Street and Hennepin Avenue from 1889 to 1961, and more on the significance of that in a minute in relation to art galleries. In 1893, Robert Cole became the director of the Minneapolis School of Fine Arts, now the Minneapolis, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and he was really influential in setting up those first collections um, of uh, paintings in Minneapolis for the art gallery. As with the hybrid interdisciplinary nature of New York School, it's not only the visual arts that guest is interested in. In thinking of you, Prokofiev, and there's a coming together of weather, industry, music, and sound. The music is overlaying the Minneapolis street scene, just as Kohler's French Impressionism does in the painting. It's like the gesture by Frank O'Hara. However, the difference, I would argue, in relation to the book as a whole, the network of constellations and possibilities that it sets up between prose and lyric poems, is that the thought opens up the possibility of a sustained imaginative detournment, poetic engagement with sight, history and context, beyond a single lyric gesture, a glance which is, might be seen as a glancing aside or a nod to a reference's point. In this poem, and here I'm referring to the book as a whole, there's a more spatial opening of an imaginative area or space, atmosphere, across a network of relations enabled by guests reading of the museum and the formation of its collection in relation to the city and its landscape, as well as the possibility of theatrical performance in this space. Thinking of you, Prokofiev, that tricky snow outside makes steam indoors and the china tea we brew keeps us quick, is Prokofiev whose doors slam, steam never lessens its latitude in the sky like Prokofiev, while many cars creep over the bridge, sweating, finally equipped, equipped with their Mahler treads. The steam is perhaps clouds or fog. Prokofiev famously, famously exper experimented with trying to replicate the noise of the steam engine, the fog horns of ships, into his music. And we also have water here, the river, the kinetic energy of the poem, possibly thinking of Olsen, rivers and water run through the whole of the book. The poem takes on different qualities of waters, of the water, water across the town, across the city. And the section, um, the writing itself, follows different modes of writing, which are sometimes prose-like, other times equipped like Prokofiev. Water wheels, river runs, river sides over and under falls, twice rapid, brown, slow turn, fist thrust, signal ahead, winter, autumn, water, barge, sea, Price, water bank, bridge system, barge, deep search, over falls, rush edge, search nearly there, river bottom, surge, bridge spread. This is in contrast to the writing of direct comparison that she makes in the book between the Mississippi and the Seine. Although Paris has only one river, the Seine, this river behaves perfectly reasonably within the city limits, or on Dismore, approaching the Isles with a courtliness and depositing its burdens with a verb one used to associate with the beret. <laughs> a manner is thus maintained by the stem which we define as raison d'etre, or state Diane, or the French way of looking at things. Sometimes it's true, it can hold. Um, when, I come to the, when I come to the subject of Minneapolis and its posture on the Mississippi, a confusion like a drought descends upon me. So what I think is interesting here is that in order to carry on the representation of Mississippi and its rivers, what's necessary for um, what's necessary for guests, guests to activate is the kinetics of the thing, and this kinetics of the thing by Charles Olson seems to be only activated by an application or a writing over or a painting over of a European avant-garde. And if it's not there, then confusion like a drought descends upon me. So what we have is not just the water of the Mississippi overlaid with um, art, but also um, the, the, the natural water of the Mississippi overlaid with, with, with sound, with, with sonic texture. So, so she runs a series of filters across it. She's also running together the studio practice of her friend Mary Abbott, which is the reason why she's in um, 
which is the reason why she's in um, Mississippi. And in this we see a phenomenological merging of an overlay or superimposition of both painting and of music. Um, music, painting, writing and drawing. In, in this poem she says, um, I make a sketch from the window. Separations begin with placement. The black organizes the ochre, both earth colors. Quietly the blanket assumes its shapes. On the grey day, loops along leaving an edge turned like leaves into something else. And this is um, Mary Albert with one of her paintings and Barbara Guest slightly photographs are slightly out of date the sense that this is about ten years before the poem that we're talking about and this is Guest um, about 1960. So these are a bit earlier photographs but both of them embedded in the New York scene and Guest very much interested in being with her friend in collaboration. Um, they do a series of poem, um, poem text um, collaborations um, which draw together writings by Guest and um, poems, poems uh, writings by Guest and, and artwork by Mary Abbott. And of course, Guest is also experimenting with these combinations in her own work. But it gives a sense, I think, that in 1976, Barbara Guest is, is wanting to extend that collaborative reach of the, what is experienced in the New York School into something in relation to carry on across space and time with Mary Abbott. So running through the um, running through the book is um, is a set of narratives and a set of partial narratives which imagine a story around a uh, real or imagined countess. And in the in the museum, which um, the, the previous painting is from, which seems to be the constellated set of references around which the poem um, sets, there are a number of countesses, um, and I think all of them can make their way into the the, the scope of the book. But I think this one is a, this painting is of particular interest to guest because it's by B.J. Lebrun and it's a, it's a, it's a, a female artist and she's uh, making a painting of an, an Austrian <coughs> countess. Um, and it fits in thinking also back to this sort of sense of the Pushkin enclosure. So the Queen of Spades, um, which is the score composed by Sir, Sir Sergei Prokofiev in 1936 is made for the planned but unrealized film by Mikhail Rom. The film is to be based on the 1834 short story The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin and was intended for release in 1937, the centenary of Pushkin's death. But wasn't. It wasn't ever, didn't ever come together. So in this sense, I think, um, I think Gust is aware of this, in a sense, this possibility of a speculative space of imagination between art, between um, a set of countesses <coughs> that she finds in the museum, and a set of relationships between Pushkin um, and Prokofiev and music and art coming together. The figures in, 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 in this book are ones that she explores. She's not afraid to explore the tensions between the figure and abstraction, which permeate, um, I think, the tension that I think is set up between, um, say, personism and, and a relationship to what abstract, ab abstract expressionism can be figured as. So in that sense, what she begins to figure in the book is personism, not just as a conversation on the telephone, but a network of associative and imagined conversations with real and imagined personae. She picks up and extends this tropes of self in performance, as evident in previous collaborations, and I think thinking of those between O'Hara and Hartigan. And Mary Abbott is, is also playfully satirized throughout the book as well, both in terms of her name, she becomes Mary Rude, and she's also embedded in um, joke in sort of playful plays on the name Mary, uh, playfully satirized for her trips to Haiti. The Countess, then, is not a fixed, not a fixed entity. It's not, it's not condensed or held by this portrait. It's something which is mobile and across different figures. Um, and this, I think, also speaks to this idea of the Pushkin's enclosure, a mobile set of possibilities um, and associations that, that guests can run with, that she finds in the museum. 
um, that aren't confined to any one person. So is this the idea that I could say, this is the countess? Um, and so another figure that this fits with, that shows up in the book, is the figure of the theatre designer Tanya Mosowicz, who at the same time that the guest was there, there's an exhibition of her theatre design, so this sense of design for the theatre and that theatrical space being something which might make its way into the book um, seems to be really important um, in relation to the Guthrie Theatre. What we also have here is the sense of um, places and spaces being overlaid in terms of a kind of travel writing. Um, the Countess talks of the further exoticism of reading a British novel while visiting Duluth. The Countess usually tucked one into her dressing case when preparing for a visit to one of Theodoric's relations. Perhaps, perhaps, guess writes, like reading the river Niger while dining alone um, in New York, sympathised her cousin Glanville. So you get a sort of fictive overlay. And what this points to um, is also a network, not just of images in the collection, but of the, of the associations that she looks into in relation to the curators of the collection of the museum. And one of these um, is John Graham. And John Graham's system and dialectics of art was really, really influential um, for New York School of writers and artists. And John Graham himself is a figure, a Ukrainian figure, who kind of reinvents himself and his move um, moved to the United States in a way that is really interesting in terms of the sort of self modes of performance, of remaking of, of self. He organized the major exhibition in 1942 at New York's Macmillan Gallery called French and American Painters the landmark show provided the first public exposure for Jackson Pollock and William de Kuhn. Um, so there's this, this set of um, pressures, I suppose, network of relations existing in relation to the book that I think that um, and John Graham shows up in, in the book in terms of a conversation with the Countess. And then there's also um, a list of activities which seem to exceed the museum, which are also seem to be strangely about being in the present, also what she's thinking about, which, which move along at a dizzying pace in relation to sort of energy beyond the museum, energies of thinking, energies of being in the world, and interestingly mark a very particular moment in time. Um, so you have this amazing description, jazz boots, mosquitoes, covered bridges, our ship, hold walls, our must walk us. Nostalgia for the days when one searched for furniture, those pre saranin days, for some the pre-Alto decade. And clearly what's being marked here is a move, um, a move from kind of Victorianism or a move um, pre-modernism. And there's nostalgia associated with that break. And it's interesting that that's continually figured in the language of the writing throughout the book, this break between kind of modernist um, acculturation of all these different activities mixed with quite distinct statements of time in relation to collections. And the other really important um, object that she draws on in relation to the museum is this object in the museum, which is um, a jade, which was collected by, again, one of the founders of the museum, T.B. Walker. Um, and the, the, it's a really interesting piece of work because it represents, um, it represents a, both poem um, and it also represents um, activity. It represents uh, poets coming together in a, a poetic festival um, during which uh, the cups were thrown into water and whoever picked up the cup would speak a poem. And so what's interesting is the way in which this object is there, and it's just in, a, um, it's in the, uh, the corridor that she keeps passing, but it's something which makes its way into the text as she thinks about this, this um, object that's jade as a way of figuring a kind of landscape within the landscape. So if she's bringing with her, in a sense, the landscape of the Seine and of Paris, 
She's also finding landscapes in the museum as well, that the work exists in relation to. So you get this very strange and very chance encounter in a sort of surrealist way between this jade mountain figured in relation to ideas about the Pushkin enclosure and the Countess figured in relation to ideas about modernist, modern, modernist writing, that sort of expressionist writing. When remembered fireflies on the riverbanks and mosquitoes, the snow falling onto vanished wings despairs equivalents of winter crossings. Old Chinese men with shoulders bent under their thin kimonos, passing over bamboo bridges, mountain paths going ever upwards into fog swirls. And in those fog swirls, I think you can see the coming together of the fog mentioned earlier in the poem where she's looking outside the window, possibly um, into the, the into the depth or street, into thinking about the, the kind of imaginative speculative space around this jade um, object. And this jade mountain, um, which is the title of it, is illustrating the gathering of scholars at the Langton Pavilion in 1790, which was collected in 1915, began its life um, as a sort of collective piece, and was a, is actually figured here. Um, in the house of T.B. Walker, who collected it in his house rather than the art gallery. This is a dinner table set up. Um, so this sort of food eating down the, um, the, the, the um, quite strange object. Um, so you can see that this has a bearing on um, how then she makes sense of what she's doing with, with, with elements of the poem by alluding to the poem which is inscribed onto that mountain of jade, carved with these figures, which in a way you could see as being elements of what she's imagining throughout the poem. There was a poem with a moon in it, travelling across the bridge in one of those fragile trains carrying very small loads, like moons that one could never locate anywhere else. The Mississippi was bright under the bridge like a sun, because the poem called itself the sun also, two boxcars on the bridge crossing the river. So as the poem began with the sense of the overlaying of, of Paris onto Mississippi, onto, onto, um, of the Seine onto the Mississippi, um, here we have something else, something much more speculative, uh, m m much, much, much more away from that sort of direct relationship to a European avant-garde, thinking about other um, forms. And it seems a jump, but where we end up at the end of the poem is to go from the jade object, which is down, which is halfway up the museum, to the installation of the, the Tony Smith sculpture Amaryllis, which is installed on the top of the museum. This is not the skyline in, in um, um, Mississippi. But what's interesting is that the poem. Um, this is the description of the, of the Tony Smith piece. The orange metal plant spread its tendrils aloof over the museum's roof, with all its fragrant captivity asserting the immigrant rights of sculpture, restrained by metal from whispering, from complaint, even from homesickness. Amaryllis, with its antique name, its distant origins, held a regal stance. Between its position and the blockades of the city, between it and the nearest reliquary, there remained no community. Amaryllis could never yield its superior stance, its moods, glances with those of an observer, less restless as time passed, yet one who possessed the claim to restrict its grace. There could be detected something of the borrower here, rather the lender, an attitude the museum's curator, curator recognized would never change. He questioned the effect of those regal metal blooms upon the visitors. He worried if the city were aware of the undisturbed and selfish enchantment Amaryllis cast, a piece of art that through a collector's whim had come to dwell in Minneapolis. But what's interesting is that we have the poem pretty much inserted into this strange space in terms of the architecture of the museum between the jade um, figuring of the landscape here and the minimalism, the show of minimalism on top. So I want to suggest that this strange, com quite compressed space with the, with the pressures of what happens in 1970s art bearing down on the museum collection in terms of the collected jade with also the background of the expressionism. These pressures make for a really interesting set of 
questions and possibilities for what, that, what this text might become. And interestingly, what she does is in fact not move back to a modernist um, framing of, 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 of language, but into something um, more medieval. Um, so, Scott, a poet with Smith. So, um, the Scott is the known name for a poet as represented in Old English poetry. Um, the Scott is the Old English counterpart of the Norse, uh, Old Norse Scout. Um, and what we have here is, 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 is something, the Widsmith is a traveller's tale, a kind of a, um, a, 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 a poem which brings together many different travels, um, and I think that's what she's referencing here. But it becomes a new way of defining what the poet is, I think, in relation to these competing pressures um, from the different arts that she finds that she's also drawing on. So scoping along this Mississippi, I as Scott, Coasting the Midwest, musing the margins, earthier and river rack, breathing and groping. I, at Scott, making my weird, I saw many fellows, lives and liquor, hoarders, drawers of the dream, also rivers by the river, daughter of the rood. All have heard of the musicians ravishing the museum walkers, mirth morsels, the lake scops in land inward, impressing the bairns' words, his ribbons of runes, gusts from guthrie stage, spoken ear oaths. Alas, an afternoon, the wind sprung, word tokens, host hoardings. Shearers of sheets, the frames of finished fine arts, like jovial jousts, surmounting the silence where prairie prunes cuddle and clash. So I think what we have is, is a really interesting that, that in in this this reach out so via the jade poem um, to the old English uh, idea of the Scot and the Widsmith, we have a traveller's tale which is bearing the pressures of all these different really important and interesting associated possibilities, none of which map neatly onto each other in a kind of singular way. So what I want to suggest is that out of this possibilities of this poem, which is a kind of baggy monster of a poem, it's usually with baggy, it's a fantastic piece, but it's like the jade, there's a kind of um, monstrousness about the jade, um, which, which is the kind of more so the figure of the poem. We have a set of questions to carry on in relation to what comes after um, and what makes what, what this kind of, this work makes possible in relation to something after the New York School. The idea of Paris, the centre of the European avant-garde, is refigured in Midwest America, and there is irony and absurdity and play around the possibilities of that, which I think is really interesting. But there's a space for performance to enact and theatrically play with that. There's the romanticism of pre-revolution here, which is, I think, maps onto the, down to the politics of the 1970s, the modernists in exile, which are figured in, in, the, in the text in relation to mentioned Strindberg, but he's sort of floating there as well, and John D. Graham, the sort of modernists who are there, lonely and in exile. And the ekphrasis as a response to a single work of art is replaced by a plural engagement with the environment and history of the museum as archive of one which, which can bear the weight of personal association, memory, the museum as speculative repository, which makes for the space that the book can become. It opens the possibilities for a longer form poem, the river is conduit, both actual and mythic, so it's important that she both writes about the, the river of um, Mississippi, maps it over the Seine, but then it's also alive to the possibilities of the river in the jade sculpture which is also mapping itself back onto the drinking festival, um, uh, drinking possibilities of the Cedar Tavern and Bar. So the self and performance um, as embodied in a kind of practice, which is also a living of life to its fullest. The collectivity of the Cedar Bar is replaced by the, um, is, 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 well, is overlaid by the Jade Mountain, but also again to reflect a collaborative space between artists refigured in the semi-holy rite with spiritual connotations, a meeting of art and life, a chance encounter with eclectic objects and persons, apparently out of context, but the book makes a new one. 